Okay, um, we are now being recorded. And again, welcome to all of you um, for joining us today. We're really excited um, about everything that we're going to be covering. And just um, a note quickly at this point, um, if you have not already tested your computer speakers and you'd like to hear us that way instead of through the phones, you will be able to do that. Um, if you encounter any audio problems and you want to switch to talking uh, or to listening rather through the phone line, um, that number is 866-670-7160. And um, we will make sure that you get connected and you're able to hear us one way or the other. So I wanted to just introduce um, who all you'll be hearing from today. Um, on the left side of your screen, you'll see Carrie Smith. She's a senior campus prevention specialist, and she will be co-facilitating um, with me today. And I'm a senior prevention specialist. We're both with SPRC. We also have Dominique Glue behind the scenes helping us with the technology piece. So um, you won't hear from her, but she is very much um, a big part of making this happen today. So I wanted to give her a shout out. Um, and we are also so pleased to have with us two guests today um, as our presenters. Um, first, we have Julia Graff, who is a staff attorney with the Baslin Center for Mental Health Law. We also have Dolores Cimini, um, and she has been a part of both the cohorts one and three JLS grantee projects with the University at Albany. And I'm really excited because I personally get to interview Dolores um, later on in the presentation. And I think it'll be really enjoyable um, for everyone. So something to look forward to. And right now, um, if you are having any technical problems, either with the platform um, or with the phone lines, I think for the most part it's the platform that would be the most problematic, um, you can call SPRC at 617-618-2380. You can also call Adobe Connect. They're the ones who are responsible for the platform that we're using at 800-422-3623. I'd like to draw your attention to the chat text box, which is to the left side of the screen. You'll see it. It's right underneath my picture. You can use that box to type in any questions or comments that you have. And then if you wanted to see things bigger, especially if there's a lot of text on any of the slides, you can click the full screen button on the upper right um, of your screen to make the presentation larger. And then you can just click that button again to return it to the normal view. So I wanted to touch on our agenda and what we'll be covering today. We are going to start out by talking a little bit about the comprehensive approach to suicide prevention and then touch on the key planning considerations for protocol development. We'll get into some of the important legal considerations. And then, like I had mentioned, we'll be able to hear from one of your peers, a campus example from the University at Albany, and that'll be Dolores, um, who you'll be hearing from. And then we'll have an opportunity to open things up for a little bit more um, time for questions and answers, um, a little bit of discussion, and you'll hear about some next steps. And throughout the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to use the chat box for any questions or comments that you might have, although we've also built in some time um, at several points during the um, agenda for you to be able to ask your questions then as well. So at this point, I'm going to hand things over to Carrie so she can talk about the comprehensive approach. Carrie? Great. Thanks, Gail. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the webinar. We're happy that you could join us. Um, so hopefully you've all seen this model by now. Uh, following crisis management procedures is part of the SPRC JED Foundation comprehensive approach to suicide prevention and mental health promotion. Um, so having protocols in place for what should happen in the event a student becomes distressed or is in crisis is really an important part of any campus suicide prevention program, um, especially I know many of you are beginning to train gatekeepers to identify for students at risk for suicide, so you really want to have some plans in place for what will happen um, if someone does encounter a student in distress. Um, from the responses we've received on the protocol inventory form that we sent out before the webinar and the poll question that we had for you today in the lobby, 
um, it looks like people are in different places with their protocols, um, but that they're feeling okay or figuring things out. Um, we'll be going over some considerations today that apply to developing protocols, um, but also revising protocols and how to make them more inclusive and effective. I'll be moving pretty quickly through my part of the material today so we can hear from Julia and Dolores. So please feel free to type in any questions you have or any clarifications you might want into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, also, as a reminder, your assigned prevention specialist is here to talk with you if you have any lingering questions after today's event or would like him or her to review your protocols or provide feedback. So the Jet Foundation has created a really great resource for developing protocols. Um, it has a really long title. It's called the Framework for Developing Institutional Protocols for the Acutely Distressed or Suicidal College Student. Um, we sent a link out to this document in the weekly program reminders. So hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at it by now. Um, if you haven't looked at this resource yet, it walks through a series of planning questions for developing protocols and has some tips for maximizing the success of your protocols. So if you're new to crisis protocol development, where do you start? Here's some questions you'll want to ask yourself as you think about developing or revising your campus's protocols. In the interest of time, we'll really just focus on the first four bullets that I have here. Um, but the Jed Foundation framework does include some tips for disseminating your protocols and educating your campus community about their roles. Um, and this is something you certainly can discuss with your prevention specialist if you have any questions or would like to brainstorm ideas. So before you embark on developing your protocols, you'll want to do a little bit of research. Um, so first you want to find out what already exists on your campus. Uh, if you have a counseling center on campus, it's likely that they have protocols for dealing with students in crisis. Um, but other departments such as Red's Life, Campus Security, Student Affairs, all of them may have um, protocols or guidelines that they follow as well. Some departments may also have unwritten guidelines that they may use during an emergency. Um, so it's really helpful to do an inventory of what already exists. Um, when you look at what already exists on your campus, you want to keep track of any areas where various protocols differ or contradict each other and know when they were last revised and who was responsible for creating them. Um, consistency throughout policies and protocols is really essential. Also, to help with the planning, you want to find out if there's any sort of university template for creating protocols and guidelines and what type of approval process you might have to go through to have your protocols adopted by your university. Okay, um, so we want to hear from you now. Um, so who do you think should be included in the process of developing and revising your crisis protocols? Um, and if you can, you just type your thoughts into the left hand um, side in the chat box there on your. Wait a minute for folks to type. Yeah, I think university police, so security and university police are really important. Student affairs, local mental health providers, so maybe not just on campus, but off campus as well. Or student affairs, dean of students, res life, counseling, very important. Um, Barbara also made an important point here with legal affairs. Housing, university relations. Eric also wonders if maybe parents should be involved. That's an interesting question. Great, so just another second to make sure everyone's typed in their thoughts. Health services, you guys have covered a lot of the important players here. Faculty, great. Okay, thanks so much for your thoughts. I think you guys covered a lot of the important players. Um, once you've identified your relevant stakeholders, it's important to clearly define their roles and responsibilities. So within this, you want to decide who will be included in the development or review process uh, for your protocols, and also who has a role in the implementation and use of these protocols. 
Um, some campuses may choose to bring together a large group of stakeholders to develop their protocols to make sure that all the necessary areas get covered, um, while others prefer to include a smaller group of people in the development process, but then ask a broader group to review the protocols and provide feedback. Um, either way, you'll want to consider how you'll take steps to get feedback from folks on campus to make sure your protocols adequately outline the roles and responsibilities of your key community members. Um, you also want to make sure, uh, as someone mentioned, if you don't involve them in the actual development process, you want to at least include your university's legal counsel in the review process. So next is thinking about who your audience is for your protocols. Some schools decide to make one document for the whole campus community, um, so including students, while others prefer to make separate documents for, say, faculty or staff or just for students um, or campus administrators. So who your intended, intended audience is will also determine some of the language that you'll use and specific ways you'll want to tailor the information. If you don't include students in your audience for your protocols, then you'll want to consider how your campus will convey this information to students. It's important that your protocols be transparent with students and their parents or guardians understanding the steps your school takes when a student is in crisis. So now we want to hear from you guys again with the million dollar question, um, what should you include in your crisis protocols? So if you could just type again in the chat some things that you think are important to include in crisis protocols. Another few minutes while people type their thoughts. have a few things here already. People are talking about the importance of um, reporting and confidentiality, um, point of entry for the client, follow-up is another important piece, emergency contact numbers, those are also important. Uh, here about communication and the flow of, of what would happen if a student is in crisis. Other thoughts? Another minute. Counseling for students and for student friends of a student. Um, so yeah, that's an important piece as well. Uh, not just the person who's in crisis, but um, those who may be also affected by the crisis. Great. You guys have some great thoughts about this. Um, so the Judd Foundation protocol um, framework is divided into three main topic areas that you'll want to think about addressing either in your crisis protocols or other campus policies or guidelines. Um, because we're really short on time, I'll only be touching on a few areas within these broader topic areas. So this is by no means a complete list of what you'll want to consider when developing your protocols. So within de developing a safety protocol section, the framework prompts you to consider who would prepare staff or other campus community members to identify a student at risk um, so would you provide a list of warning signs or some other sort of education? And the steps that they should take once they have identified a student they're concerned about. Establishing clear guidelines on the roles of different community members. Um, so for instance, how does a faculty member or student's role differ from a campus administrator or counseling staff member? Um, and who is responsible for responding to these concerns? That's a really crucial piece. Also, what decision-making process would take place once a student of concern has been identified? Um, this section also prompts readers to do some thinking about the types of assessments you might want to use and who should be responsible for these. Um, 
also how will you determine if a student who needs help, um, what should happen if they refuse it? Uh, also, you want to address what happens after a suicide attempt has been made. Um, so thinking about what happens after an acute crisis is, is over is also important. Um, so including guidelines about post-crisis follow-up can be helpful. Um, I should mention here that these are really difficult questions, and it's important to point out that you have to walk a fine line of providing detailed protocols so that people know exactly what their roles and responsibilities are, but also preserving flexibility to handle each student's situation in a case-by-case -case basis. Um, this can be really tough to do, but we know that the campus environment in of itself can be protective against suicide, so we want to work collabor collaboratively with students to determine the best course of action um, to address their mental health needs. Uh, the creators of the framework also recommend that all colleges and universities have written emergency contact notification protocol that clearly define when notifications can take place um, and the details, the university's role, um, and expectations of these notifications. So it's important to outline the process of deciding whether or not to notify an emergency contact, um, especially when a student may not want the notification to take place. Um, it's really important to note that colleges should avoid making blanket mandates regarding notification and instead um, make these decisions on a case-by-case -case basis with the understanding that not all students have a healthy relationship with their parents or designated contacts. Um, all of this information should be communicated directly with students in their emergency contacts. Um, the framework also recommends that this information be published in, say, a student handbook or on the appropriate university web pages so that it's easily accessible and can really be The framework also recommends having formal leave and reentry protocols, and I know we have some questions about that. Um, hopefully, those protocols can be in place to help normalize taking leaves of absence when necessary and to make the process seem less daunting. Um, so as this kind of implies, the information should, readily be, should be readily accessible to students so that they understand the process. Um, it's important to take into account the positive and negative um, accounts of what would happen if a student took a leave of absence for mental health reasons. So for instance, what would happen if a student left in the middle of the semester? Um, you might want to explore what would happen to the student's health insurance coverage through the university if they take a leave of absence or, or cut back um, to part-time. Also, you want to work through the reentry process, which Julia will touch on a little bit in her legal considerations in a few minutes. Also, I wanted to mention post-pension here for just a minute. Um, some schools also decide that they want to add guidelines for what should happen in the event of a student death on campus. Uh, Post-pension isn't really covered, unfortunately, in the Judd Foundation framework, but it can be helpful to have protocols in place for what happens in the event of a student suicide on campus, um, and maybe listing what types of interventions or activities take place in the aftermath of a suicide. Um, and this is, again, uh, something that your prevention specialist can talk with you about if you have any questions about kind of how to add that into protocols. So there's a lot to think about when developing protocols. So some main points in terms of maximizing the success are uh, making sure that the roles and responsibilities of your key stakeholders on campus are clearly outlined in your protocols and the procedures are clear and consistent consistent throughout. Um, I really can't overstate the importance of the consistency. Uh, in an emergency, you want people to know exactly what to do to help a student in crisis. Also, be sure to define any terminology you use um, so that your protocols are clear and easy to understand. Um, and lastly, it's helpful to designate a point person who is responsible for answering any questions that come up about the protocols. Um, this person may want to be responsible also for making sure that protocols are up to date um, and make any revisions that need to be made periodically. Um, so that was my quick and dirty uh, description of what, what should be included in crisis protocols and some considerations. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Julia Graff now from the Bazelon Center to talk more about legal considerations for student mm -hmm. mental health that may influence developing your protocols. Hi everyone, I am going to try to walk through um, very quickly, oh let's get that off my face, um, through um, 
the legal framework and the analytic steps that you need to go through when confronted on your campus with a student in crisis who uh, you believe may be at risk of suicide. Um, I'm a disability rights lawyer, and I know a lot of people may not initially think about suicide or self-harm in terms of disability, but the vast majority of people who do engage in, engage in self-injurious behaviors have some kind of a, a mental illness. And as a lawyer, kind of the approach that I, that I bring is, as a lawyer for people with psychiatric disabilities um, is to view my job as helping people with mental illness to, lead li to live lives of their own design. And this stems from a rights-based perspective that I bring as a civil rights lawyer, but also as a mental health advocate. It really comes from a recognition that individual autonomy is therapeutic and really an integral part of people's recovery processes. At the Baslin Center, uh, a lot of our work is on reforming public systems as well as private and public actors like employers and schools of all types from elementary to post-secondary institutions to help them realize their non-discrimination obligations toward people with disabilities. So that brings us to this first slide that we're already on um, and discussing what these obligations are and where they come from. Um, you've probably all heard of Section 504 of the Rehab Act and of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA was amended a few years ago in 2008. Uh, titles two and three are um, applicable to you, titles two for state colleges and three to private colleges. And then of course section 504 applies to all of you. And then I also uh, wanted to flag the Fair Housing Act that you just need to be aware of its anti-discrimination provisions because it applies to university housing, which some people don't realize. So housing has to be accessible. Universities have to grant reasonable accommodations to their housing policies for people with disabilities, including people with psychiatric disabilities. Um, and they must review their policies or practices to ensure that they don't discriminate against people with disabilities. Um, and hopefully we can talk more about accommodations um, later on. Um, we also have um, the regulations implementing those new statutes. Uh, we have um, judicial opinions when judges are interpreting those statutes and they're implementing regulations with respect to um, a particular situation that arises when, a, when um, in your cases, a, a student um, would litigate after uh, having an adverse action taken against them. And then we also have some guidance from the United States Department of Education's Office on Civil Rights where students don't wish to litigate, um, but they can file a complaint. Um, the OCR will investigate, and some of you might have experience with this or some knowledge of it. Um, and so that's the, the resolution letters that arise as a result of those investigations um, can also offer guidance and is another source we can look to in this area. Um, so moving on, um, this is really a nutshell of everything I'm going to say. Um, disability law is a bit different than other areas of civil rights law and anti-discrimination law um, in that in addition to refraining from overtly discriminating against uh, people with disabilities, you also have affirmative obligations to provide um, reasonable accommodations. And basically, you know, I know that a lot of disability support services offices on campus will have kind of a checklist of accommodations. Um, I always kind of advise people to just crumble that up and throw it away um, because there's no, the sky's kind of the limit with accommodations. And uh, I know too that a lot of disability support services offices aren't necessarily um, primed to think about accommodations for psychiatric disabilities. And in fact, some have policies that are entitled something like accommodations for physical and learning disabilities. So that's just something to keep in mind. Anything is a reasonable accommodation that, that helps mitigate the impact of someone's disability unless it constitutes an undue burden or a fundamental alteration. Um, an undue burden generally has to do with um, cost and the fundamental alteration will often have to do with um, if someone requested an, an accommodation that would sort of alter the, say, the course requirements for a particular major or something like that. So, um, so that, that's a bit on, on reasonable accommodations. There's an exception for, you know, you don't have to accommodate someone who, as a result of their disability, poses a direct threat 
to self or others, and that's defined as a significant risk of substantial harm. Um, I know that there is some buzz around the regulatory changes in Title II of the ADA, um, so I just want to acknowledge that for purposes of this conversation, given that there is um, a bit of a lack of guidance in this area, I am assuming that at least at a minimum, you must consider the same four factors um, in situations where a student's disability presents a significant risk of substantial self-harm, that you would have to consider at least at a minimum the same four factors that you would need to consider um, for people whose disabilities might lead to a risk of harm to others. And we'll get to those four factors in a minute, but I do just want to say, um, and I can't emphasize enough, that it is the extremely rare situation when this exception will apply, that someone will pose a significant risk of substantial self-harm that cannot be responsibly addressed by providing the student with reasonable accommodations. Um, from, from our perspective here at the Bazelon Center, what we see too often in our practice is schools reacting in really unhelpful and discriminatory ways to students who have engaged in self-harm um, when there's no basis to do so but prejudice or ignorance. Um, okay, so I'm just going to move on now to the direct threat assessment. Um, whether someone poses a direct threat must be determined based on an individualized assessment. So um, if, if you don't remember anything else from this presentation, the two words individualized assessment uh, are the most important things. You can't rely on stereotypes or your assumptions based on a diagnosis or based on what most people with a particular diagnosis uh, need or should have or should do. And importantly, you really have to use the most current and objective medical evidence. You can't, you know, if, if someone has a current treatment provider, um, you can't just call the old treatment provider that you already knew who is going to tell you what you want to hear. You really have to, you really have to take in the information and rely on the resources and the, the you know, the students, most, the, the most current and objective medical evidence available um, as part of that analysis. Um, so the four factors that you need to take into account um, at a minimum are the nature, duration, and severity of the risk, and the probability that the potential injury will actually occur. Um, now again, this is a narrow circumstance when, when these factors are going to come out um, and uh, lead to a determination that someone actually does pose a significant risk of substantial self-harm. Um, or harm to others. Uh, so let's go through this step by step. First, you have to identify the nature of the risk. Courts have said that this requires you to identify the specific behaviors that pose a significant risk. It's not enough to say she's suicidal or he has depression um, or even we're afraid she's going to harm herself. The Supreme Court has said that your belief that a significant risk of harm exists, even if it's maintained in good faith, is insufficient and won't relieve you of liability if you rely on stereotypes or speculation instead of that objective evidence. Second, determine the duration of the risk. Is the behavior of concern triggered by something that is likely to pass, or is this a longer-term risk? Third, what is the severity of the risk of harm caused by the identified behaviors of concern based on objective medical evidence? And fourth, determine the probability of occurrence. Has this behavior occurred in the past? with what frequency, under what conditions. Will those conditions be present going forward? Can they be eliminated? And this brings us to the other, um, to the issue of whether the risk can be eliminated through accommodations, which um, is part of this analysis. And I provided for you at the bottom of this slide the regulatory citations. You can just cut and paste those um, into a search engine and come up with the text, the language of the, of the regulations. And you can see that that um, direct threat is defined as a significant risk of substantial harm that cannot be eliminated through the provision of reasonable accommodations, modifications of policies and practices, et cetera. Um, so I'll illustrate this with a quick example, um, it, which would be about someone's tendency, um, say, say that someone's tendency to self-harm can be effectively um, eliminated when they take medications but the medications cause morning sedation. And for the purposes of this example, let's suppose that the student stopped 
taking her medications because of a, uh, there's a course that's critical to her major that's only offered at 9 in the morning, and she wants to be alert for it. A reasonable accommodation might be permitting this student, you know, so say she goes off the medications and she starts to get into a crisis situation. Um, at that point, um, a reasonable accommodation might be, which she could ask for affirmatively by disclosing her disability to the Disability Support Services Office, or if she um, gets into a situation where she comes to the attention of folks in the counseling services or elsewhere in the administration um, and people are considering uh, taking some sort of adverse action, like uh, requesting that she take a voluntary leave or imposing an involuntary leave. At that point, um, it's incumbent upon you to kind of go through an accommodations analysis and work with the student, disability support services, counseling, her own treatment providers, um, and, and figure out, in this situation, it could be quite simple. A reasonable accommodation might be permitting the student to take the course out of sequence um, so that she can take it the following semester when it's scheduled in the afternoon and, you know, removing the barriers to kind of withdrawing even if it's past the drop date and allowing her to take it the following semester even if that makes it out of sequence. If that can't happen, another reasonable accommodation could be to waive any attendance or in-class participation requirements and just tape the course lectures so that she can watch them in the afternoons um, when she is able to be more alert. So these are some examples of reasonable accommodations that can eliminate the student's tendency towards self-harm and allow her to remain enrolled and actively engaged in her studies. Um, in the residence hall situation, you can imagine a situation where someone's disability um, and tendency toward self-harm might be triggered by a particular dynamic in the residence hall. In that case, you could explore accommodations such as granting the student a single or allowing him to live off campus, maybe with a support person of his own choice. Um, even where the university policies might indicate that students generally need to live on campus. Um, these are all reasonable accommodations. The point is that you have to do an individualized assessment to figure out what kinds of accommodations will be relevant to the particular student. And only after doing this kind of extensive analysis and consideration of accommodations can any sort of involuntary leave be considered. Carrie mentioned earlier that um, remaining on, uh, remaining enrolled and engaged in the campus community and in one's academic pursuits can be a protective factor for suicide. I chose this quote to include in the presentation. Uh, it's one of my, you know, obviously it's not a legal quote, but it is one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite books. Um, uh, Frankel is a psychologist and a Holocaust survivor, uh, and this book is about his experience in concentration camps as well as the distillation of his series of psychotherapy, and I, I think that this is, um, this is a particularly relevant quote for this, for this group. Um, let's see. I want to go now to takeaways from the cases and, and different federal guidance. Um, let's see. One, individualized assessments, not blanket or zero tolerance policies. Policies that, for example, would require the eviction from student housing of anyone who attempts suicide or engages in self-harm, or policies that have the effect of criminalizing or banning behaviors um, that are manifestations of someone's disabilities, those policies, by definition, lead to adverse actions that are not based on an individualized analysis, and therefore, um, I, I would say, aren't permissible. They don't allow for a conversation about what accommodations might address any possible risk of future self-harm um, and what can be done for that particular student. Two, uh, this is really a distillation uh, or a further elucidation of the first point, which is that both courts and the OCR have said that any safety concerns that you have really need to be based in evidence, as we already went over, not on stereotypes or assumptions about um, people with particular disabilities or people whom the university believed to have a particular disability or diagnosis. Um, the third one, um, you know, you, the, the Supreme Court has said that few, if any, activities in life are risk-free. And, and for that reason, federal anti-discrimination law, the court said, doesn't ask whether a risk exists, but whether it is significant enough to constitute a direct threat. The Department of Justice has also said, you know, that the risk can only be considered when it poses a significant risk, which, is def which it defines as a high probability of substantial harm, a speculative 
or remote risk is insufficient. Um, you can't just require that individuals with disabilities be fully cured or symptom-free or stable for a particular amount of time as a condition of enrollment or re-enrollment. Um, I would liken to this to um, the, the situation with a student with cancer. Um, when the cancer comes back, if their treating provider believes that they can receive their treatments and continue with the studies, it should be that same way for students with psychiatric disabilities. Now I'm getting the signal that I need to go a little faster here. Um, no blanket waivers for medical information. OCR has been quite clear that you need to narrow your request um, for information that is relevant to help you make your decision. Um, on this, this next slide, um, clear it's important, obviously, to have clear policies on voluntary and involuntary medical leave. They need to be the same for students with physical disabilities or injuries or illnesses as for students with, um, with mental disabilities, and they should be um, clearly explained to the student and available online for them to, to go over again. Um, on six, I'll just say the enrollment criteria. Let me add here quickly that OCR has stated that if the student presents a health professional's approval for returning to school following a medical leave, the school cannot require a second assessment by its own people or by a third party unless there are, quote, extraordinary circumstances. And it has to be able to articulate a rationale for imposing the requirement of another assessment. And you can see how OCR handled this in a resolution letter just from last fall with Georgetown University, which is on our website, which Carrie will show at the end. Um, and I think that's all the uh, time that I have for now, but I can take um, a couple of questions at the end of the overall presentation. Um, thanks so much, Julia. We actually have just a couple minutes for questions, um, and we have a couple here already um, that actually I think Dolores uh, Chimini may be able to touch a little bit upon some of this um, in, her, in her piece coming up, but um, someone has a question about examples of individualized assessment. Julia, I don't know if you wanted to say a little bit more about what you mean when you say individualized assessment. Sure. The individualized assessment is really the four-factor, um, the four-step test that I went over earlier. You have to analyze the nature, severity, and duration of the harm and the probability of occurrence. And you also have to do an individualized assessment of whether there are any accommodations, reasonable accommodations that could um, mitigate the risk of harm. And those need to be rooted in who the student is as opposed to, for example, what their diagnosis is. Um, another question here is, can you clarify what you mean when you say you can't require someone to be stable um, on campus? Sure. What I'm referring to here are that I know that some colleges will say, you know, you, you can't come back yet because you need, to, you need to, show to show us that you can be stable for three months or six months or a year before you can come back. And stable meaning that you haven't had a hospitalization or something of that nature. And, you know, I was just trying to liken it to your, whatever you impose on students with psychiatric disabilities has to be equal to the conditions that you would impose on someone with a physical health disability, so a physical disability or an injury or a physical illness. Um, but, but more than that, you, just, you, can't, you can't require someone to be symptom free of their disability before, before they return. The illustration that I used about the person who who has cancer or, you know, you could say in a, in a car accident, if their treatment provider believes that being enrolled in school is, is a thing that they can successfully do and stay in treatment, you know, colleges will often also say, well, your treatment needs are too demanding for you to remain enrolled on a full-time course load. And in fact, the student's treatment provider says, well, she needs to be in therapy twice a week and an hour of med management per month with a psychiatrist. And that is not prohibitive of her also attending class or what have you. So it just needs to be an individualized thing that you have to go through. It, it, um, and you have to be talking with the student's provider where they have one. And if they don't have one, um, then at that point you can uh, have her refer off campus or have him or her um, be assessed by your counseling program and, and tailor the, the ability of the student to, to remain 
in school, but it can't be a requirement that they remain symptom free. Great. Thanks so much, Julia. Um, in the interest of time, we have to move on, but I know there's another question that came in, and we will have some more time to ask questions um, in a little while. Um, but at this point, I want to turn it over to Gail and Dolores. Thanks so much, Carrie. Um, so I am really excited, uh, again, to have an opportunity to talk more with Dolores Cimini, um, who, as I mentioned earlier, has been part of both the cohorts um, one and three GLS um, grant projects with the University of Albany. And we're going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about a couple of different aspects of Dolores's experience with um, developing and revising crisis protocols. So Dolores, are you with us? Yes. Excellent. OK. I'm going to get us started off with um, our first question, and that is whether um, you can tell us briefly about your campus and also a little bit about what your campus um, crisis protocols cover. Sure. Um, our campus, the University of Albany, is one of the four university centers in the 64 campus State University of New York system. We have about 18,000 students, 13,000 of which are undergraduates, the rest are graduate students. And the way we approach suicide prevention and prevention in other areas is through a comprehensive program. So we, we look at the issue in terms of universal reach, and that is through the whole, for the whole campus community, um, selective interventions, interventions for those students who may be at risk for suicide and other risk behaviors, and then um, indicated interventions, treatment and referral. And we have a whole um, gamut of different types of things that we do to comprise our comprehensive program across those areas. We have presidential support and leadership. We have a crisis response team and a student of concern committee. Um, we have student engagement in the issue of suicide prevention through prevention programs and through a, a peer-driven um, and professionally supervised hotline. We have parent interventions. We do research on what we do um, and, and include a number of different um, interventions in that area. Our crisis protocol was developed in 1990 and has been revised several times since that time. And it really does follow almost to the letter the JED Foundation recommendations. Uh, we have um, not only suicide of students addressed in the protocol, but we also have other types of crises. For example, a student um, going to jail, uh, a student uh, who's disruptive in class. Um, so, so a whole variety of different issues. And, and we list a definition of what the particular issue is, and then we talk about step by step what, what is done first, what's done second, what's done third, and then more importantly, who does it. Great. So it sounds like not only you have um, do you have a real comprehensive range of programming um, and initiatives that are happening on your campus, but when it comes to your protocols, those are similarly comprehensive and not only detail the specifics um, of different scenarios, but also clearly identify um, you know who's in which role and what responsibilities. Um, those people have so that, you know, when it comes to actually needing to refer to the protocols, there aren't, um, you know, as many questions or gray areas as you might run into if those things hadn't actually been spelled out beforehand. Right. Yes, we have a variety of, of different representation um, in our, in our uh, crisis management group and all the way from residential life to student affairs to student involvement and leadership, of course, the counseling center, health center, our interface center, vice president for student affairs, uh, academic affairs. Uh, we also have student representatives um, from our Middle Earth Tier Assistance Program hotline program and our student ambulance service. So we really have a cross-section of representatives who ha have informed the development of our crisis protocol, but also then um, from each of those departments, we pull first responders so that not okay. only do people have buy-in in the um, in the development of the protocol, but also in the response. Okay, great. Um, and I think that that gives us a really 
good list um, of the people who have been involved, um, you know, in implementing the protocols. And I guess I was wondering, um, I did want to ask you a bit about, hang on one second, uh, there we go. Um, who was it that you brought to the table when you were looking to create um, these protocols? I know that you just listed a number of different groups. Um, and so I'm wondering, sort of, of those people, um, you know, where where you started when you were thinking about who you wanted to be involved um, with developing these protocols, and um, and you know, sort of how that um, how that group took shape. Sure. Um, when we first developed our crisis protocol in 1990, we actually went um, and did research and looked at the protocols that existed from other schools particularly Cornell University, which had a very comprehensive protocol at the time and, and continues to. And uh, what we did is we, we looked at the um, key stakeholders that they engaged in their protocol. And we also, because we're comparable institutions in size, um, engaged similar uh, representatives. For example, our vice presidents for student affairs, academic affairs, um, and people from the Counseling Center, a leadership from the Counseling Center, Health Center, Interface Center, um, Judicial Affairs, um, academic, academic Advising. Uh, also very important to be at the table is our media office, because they're the ones that communicate with our campus and the broader community. And of course, the university police as well were involved in the planning. So, so that's really our, our key team. And, right. um, and the team meets regularly. To, to look at the protocol and, and revise it as needed. And I know that when we were asking um, participants earlier who they thought would be important to have involved in um, developing and revising protocols, a number of the people who you just mentioned were on their list, too. So it's always good to hear that people are more or less on the same page, although I do realize that um, you know things vary from campus to campus, and sometimes it, it makes more sense to be more inclusive or, or less inclusive. Um, and, and so forth. So I'm wondering now, um, you know, when you had this group assembled um, at the table to create the protocols, how did you decide what you wanted to include? Well, again, what we looked at was the models that were out there, and we looked at what was applicable to our campus. We also looked at our own history of crises that we, we experienced and how we responded to them. Um, for example, we, of course, had suicides um, occur, but not, not for a long time prior to the development of our protocol. We, we, developed, we developed it as a proactive measure. We had also had um, a campus gunman um, around the time of, well, actually shortly after the development of the crisis protocol. And so um, that was a real time to, to, use, um, to use our protocol. And so um, what we included was the information that, that is, is most direct and most essential for people to know in order to respond seamlessly to a particular crisis. And that actually changed over the years. Originally, our crisis response protocol was a very long document, like 30 or 40 pages long. It was very, wow. very detailed. And then we found it wasn't as useful as years went by, so we created a smaller version that went out to all faculty and staff. That was about a 16-page booklet. And now we've actually um, narrowed it down to a two-sided handout that we laminated. On one side is the emergency protocol, helping people determine what's urgent, what's emergent um, in, a different, in a variety of different crisis uh, categories. And then on the back of the, of the handout, there are warning signs for suicide, homicide, um, and other kinds of emergencies. And, and we like the idea of having the document laminated so that faculty and staff would be more likely to keep it on their desk. So we were able to narrow down a 40-page document, which we still have, and we refer to for the, those that need to um, look at that level of detail. But for everybody, we have a, a two-sided document that's laminated that we distribute. And it's also on the web. Oh, perfect. And I think that we have that actually um, in our link section at the end. Um, and that's that's an important lesson that you learned. I think you know it's it's very similar to the lessons that uh, a lot of us in the field learn. Um, you know, when we create these longer, more comprehensive documents, um, and then we realize that they're not as practical as being able to provide something that's that's shorter and um, you know, and, and 
beyond that, something that's a little bit more quick and dirty with, you know, a two-sided, um, you know, in your case, laminated um, reference uh, document that people will be able to, to keep around and to use, um, you know, more in the moment and that they're more inclined to refer to it. Um, so that's a really important, um, important piece of information, I think, to have in terms of how you can actually get people to access the information that you've so carefully pulled together. Um, and that leads me to my next question, which is, what are some of the lessons that you've learned during this process? Well, the lessons that we learned um, include the following. First and foremost, it's really important to engage a broad level of representation from the get-go when one is planning a crisis protocol. Um, and the most important reason for that is to get different perspectives, because different departments have different perspectives as to how things go. Um, and, and there, are, of course, are formal and informal procedures on every campus, so we need to get everybody at the table to help understand what's formal, what's informal, what, you know, what people expect um, from different departments, that kind of thing, and what really actually happens. So um, engaging those folks at the table for the broadest representation, and also for buy-in. Um, people really want to have a sense that they're valued in an important decision, such as development of a crisis protocol. So um, engaging, engaging them. And also, it's important to know that the crisis protocol is a living document. So as years go by, and as I mentioned in the, in the prior uh, question response, that uh, we, we actually change the length and the look of our crisis protocol to be more useful um, at, at different periods of time in, the, in our campus history. Um, it's important to make language clear uh, in the crisis protocol and to clearly specify who does what. Um, another important thing is when we talk about first responders, not to have only one first responder identified from every department. We want backup people because it's very, very draining to deal with suicides, um, not to mention one suicide, but also if, God forbid, we have a cluster suicide, which happened on our campus. And, um, and so to have backup people for every person, because people may need to rotate out, they may need to take breaks, they may need to take care, of course, they need to take care of themselves. That's a critical part of a crisis protocol, to specify how we are going to take care of ourselves in addition to taking care of our campus community. Okay. All really important lessons. Thank you so much um, for sharing those. And I just want to thank you um, for all of the wisdom um, that you have had to share um, during our conversation. And now I'm going to turn things over um, or back to Carrie. Um, and she is going to open things up for questions from the participant group. Hey, thanks so much, Dolores. Uh, that was really wonderful to hear your experiences um, and your wisdom of your several years now of your protocols and revisions in those. Um, so we have a few questions uh, that have come up already, and we have a couple more minutes for some more questions. So if you have a question for Dolores or Julia um, or myself, feel free to type it into the chat. And if we can't cover all of them, we'll try to follow up with you guys afterwards. Um, but Willa has a question for you, Dolores. Uh, um, actually, sorry, Judy has a question for you. Were students included in the stakeholder groups? Yes. Yes, there were two particular groups of students that were included. Our students from our Middle Earth Peer Assistance Program, we operate a, a hotline on campus that's professionally supervised. And also, we have a student ambulance corps. And that was very critical because it was our student ambulance corps for our last several suicides that were the first um, people responding and dealing with the student medically. And in those cases, they were attempting to revive each student. And unfortunately, um, that was not successful. So we needed to also you know, debrief them and, and, and give them a lot of support. So uh, critical to engage students. That's a very good point you raised. Yes, thank you. Um, and then there's a question for Julia. Um, going back to your discussion, um, can a university require a student to be in treatment to return? Um, the answer is no, but you can require that a student has to be able to meet the university's code of conduct, maintain whatever your institution's academic minimums are, um, and that the student not pose a significant risk of substantial harm to self or others. 
And if there are reasonable accommodations that would allow the student to meet those expectations, then you know, even without treatment, then the, sh the student should be able to remain. Um, you can certainly urge them that treatment could go a long way toward helping them to meet those, those obligations while, uh, while in that conversation about uh, what accommodations could also be useful. Great. Thank you. Um, and then this might be a question for either of you guys. Um, is there an example of best practices regarding how and when to contact involved family members when a student is in crisis? I can respond to that from our campus protocol, and that is what we do is when a student passes away through suicide or by any other means or if there's something very serious that involves um, risk to loss or loss of life, we uh, have our university police get in touch with the local police where the family is residing. The reason being then that the local police can, um, can go to the home of the parents and let them know in person and be there um, to assist and support should they need to. And that's, that's what we do. Um, in our and, and Dolores, when a student is in crisis, do you do any other decision making uh, about whether to contact a family member? Well, that depends on the need to know and, of course, on our clinical judgment. The, consul the counseling center is always consulted in those kinds of situations. After a suicide attempt, we have a program, which is, this is a separate webinar, but we have a program called CareNet, which is a, a follow-up program for students who attempt suicide or show signs of suicide risk. And in that case, um, the student who lives in the residence halls and, and where that occurs um, gets referred to the director of residential life, and the director of residential life informs parents, notifies parents of that as part of the program we have. And this is just Julie. I'll say quickly that you know I, I think FERPA probably is going to apply here for students who are over the age of 18 um, in terms of disclosure of you know in terms of a non non consensual disclosure of, of um, what's in the student treatment records. Um, there are exceptions for disclosure when it's necessary in an emergency to protect the health or safety of the student or another person. Um, I think the Department of Ed has said that this can happen only when there's a specific situation that presents an imminent danger, but even then, any release of information um, of, of anything in their in their records that has become part of their education record, anything in their treatment records that has been discussed with administration basically becomes part of their education records. And there's some information on this. I know that you guys are all privy to the Jed Foundation's resources, and there's one on um, legal considerations that goes into some detail about the application of FERPA and when a record goes from being a, a, treat, a confidential treatment record to when a specific part of it becomes an education record. Um, so anyway, uh, any release of, of information in the education records has to be pretty narrowly tailored um, and, is, and is to be given to appropriate parties, which are usually emergency personnel, um, not I, I wouldn't say the family. So that's just something to, to keep track of unless you have a release from the student. Thanks. Um, so unfortunately, we are just about out of time. Um, so. Thanks so much for your questions, everyone. Uh, those of you who we haven't answered your questions, we'll try to follow up with you guys after either your assigned prevention specialist or myself. I'll try to follow up with you about your questions. Um, just to take a quick look at what's on the horizon, um, you should have already gotten an email from your prevention specialist inviting you um, to sign up for some time to talk with them about your crisis protocols or the ones you have in the works. Um, so definitely sign up for those times if, if you are available and want to talk more with your prevention specialist. Um, we'll also be having the uh, final webinar in our training program, uh, Developing Successful Linkages to Community Mental Health, on Wednesday, uh, November 14th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, and you should have gotten a calendar invitation from Sheila about that. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have time for final questions, but here's the resources that uh, Julia mentioned. Um, and as Julia touched on, we didn't have time to really talk about FERPA and other um, mental health law parts like that. So definitely take a look at the Jed Foundation Student Mental Health and Law if you have questions about FERPA or HIPAA. Um, and we will be posting this webinar on our website, so don't feel like you have to copy down these links now. Um, 
our speakers, I want to thank them, Julia and Dolores, for joining us and sharing their wisdom. Um, this is their contact information. Um, and we also will be posting from Dolores her uh, protocols from her campus um, with the webinar. So